Hi, this is Lee Phillips again. Yeah, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I mean a liar. No, a lawyer. L liar, that's Texan for attorney. I'll go down and see your liar, right? any rate, I want to talk about tools that people use to avoid probate. Probate avoidance tools. And there's a whole bunch of them, and I'm going to forget some of them. But let's go through a few of them. The common one is joint tenancy and we have a full YouTube video on joint tenancy it's a disaster you don't use it I'll let you use it between a husband and a wife but never put your kids names on anything as a joint tenant with you because kids are like yogurt you never know when they're gonna go bad and by the way it's a tax it, 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 it's just a disaster uh, and it really is an avo probate avoidance tool yeah, when dad dies, mom instantly has access to the bank account and everything else because it is joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. And by the way, I ran into one the other day where they had put uh, Jim and Jane on the bank account. Jim died. They wouldn't let Jane into the bank account. Because they said, no, 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 this isn't joint tenancy. Joint tenancy is usually Jim and or Jane. And then you want to see with rights of survivorship. Uh, and it's often abbreviated joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, JTWRS or whatever that is. Uh, so yeah, that'll avoid probate when dad dies and it goes to mom, but then when mom dies, it's all gonna be probated. So joint tenancy is a kick the can down the road type theory. Then you've got the dresser drawer deed. Ah, uh, we're gonna avoid probate on the house. We're gonna make out a deed to the kids. We're gonna sign the deed. We're gonna have it notarized, everything else. We're gonna put it in the top of the dresser drawer and then when we die the kids can get the deed they go down and record the deed everything's fine yeah is it well we don't have time to go through it I think we've got a YouTube on it actually but there are uh, about seven or eight or ten elements to a deed and one of those elements to the deed is delivery putting the deed in the dresser drawer uh -uh, no delivery the deed's invalid if anybody ever challenges it. And yeah, people get away with dresser drawer deeds, but don't do it because of the tax reason again. If I get the property because mom and dad die, then it gets a step up in basis to the value on the date of their death. They bought the house for 20,000, it's now worth 100,000, if I get it because of joint tenancy, if I get it because of a deed, dresser drawer deed, in both those cases, that's a gift. And I have to take the original basis, the $10,000. If I receive it because of mom and dad's death, not the deed, but their death, then it gets a step up in basis to $100,000 on the day that they die, I sell a house next week for hundred grand, zero tax. Otherwise, you're going to pay capital gains on ninety thousand dollars, ten thousand dollar basis, hundred thousand dollar value. There are pay on death accounts, uh, delivery on death account. I mean, they're all a bunch of different names for them. Basically, what we're doing is we're setting up a baby trust. We've called it a Totten Trust uh, at the bank. And the bank agrees under contract that they will deliver this bank account to whoever's name's listed upon the death of the account holder. That will avoid probate. Uh, not much of a tax consequence because it's just money anyway. It doesn't appreciate. Hey, so we can use those. I'm not sure I like that because if you have 10 kids' names on the POD, the pay on death account, one of the kids dies, goes to his grandkids or his kids, your grandkids. Bank doesn't know who to give that to. Bank doesn't know what's going to happen. 
So now you're right back in a probate proceeding, telling the bank what to do through the court order. So yeah, pay on down to town, I work, um, but I'm not sure I'm in love with, with PODs and those transfer on deaths or whatever you want to call them. Um, the one that works is the Living Revocable Trust. If you do it right, you've got to fund it. It's got to own the property. Uh, it's got to be written well. And Fortune Magazine says that less than 1% of American lawyers know how to write them well. That's not a good statistic. Uh, but the Living Revocable Trust, and we've got lots of YouTubes on Living Revocable Trusts, they will avoid probate. They are your probate avoidance tool that you really ought to use. Tax consequences, no, uh, no asset protection on them, but, uh, but they're pretty, pretty neat tools. Uh, joint tenancy versions of that are uh, tenants by the entirety. Uh, tenants in common is not really an inheritance probate avoidance tool. Uh, so don't fall into that one, but uh, people create all of these ways to get around probate. Just don't do it. It's got a tax disaster written all over it. It's got problems. Use the Living Revocable Trust. It might be expensive. You can get a kit for it. I've got a kit for it uh, that teaches you step by step how to set it up, how to operate it, how to fund it, how to do everything else with it. And I've had it out there for 30 years now. Um, it works. Works really well. It's called the Accumulation and Preservation of Wealth Set. So check that one out. If you're really interested in avoiding probate, you got to know the secrets as to how the trust avoids probate. Otherwise, it don't happen. Lee Phillips talking on probate avoidance tools.